Okay, on with the Night of the Burning Pestle. Um, I'd like to spend just a minute telling you why I think this play is important and why I always choose it uh, when I'm doing Renaissance drama, uh, either in this uh, course or uh, in any course I've ever done exclusively on Renaissance drama. Uh, of all of the plays that we've seen, you know, that really emphasize plays within the play. And this would include, of course, um, The Alchemist, uh, big time. If we'd studied Volpone in this course, it would include that one uh, as well. Um, and, of course, we get the puppet show, the play within the play in um, Bartholomew Fair. But of all the plays that do that, including, including Shakespeare's as well, and he has a lot of plays that have plays within Midsummer Night's Dream being the most notable example, or perhaps Hamlet as a tragedy that has the mousetrap play. But of all of them, nothing examines the relationship of the audience to the theater as a money-making enterprise as this one. So one of the uh, astonishing things is watching the instant adaptation of this children's company. Of course, it's a staged staged instant adaptation. But it's basically, if I had to say the play was about one thing, it's about the adaptability and the malleability of theater to give an audience what they want quickly. Um, maybe not on the night of the performance, but um, there were hundreds of plays performed during the period of the Renaissance uh, in London. And people estimate tickets sold in the millions. So the um, the general population had an enormous appetite for theater. And they had an enormous appetite for theater-like things. Um, mock battles, for instance, at Mile End, and Rafe is going to be in, in one of those. Um, church festivals, um, any, a, a parade of any kind. Riots were good entertainment if you were, if you were an apprentice. And uh, it was sort of traditional for, for apprentice just to riot uh, every every once in a while. These were all kind of uh, entertainments, and in one way or another, they all get into the night of the, of the burning pestle. So the challenge to the company, of course, is that they want to put on a play, The London Merchant. And then in comes this other play, and somehow or other, they're able to weave it all together. It's pretty crazy and pretty nonsensical in a lot of ways, but yet it pleases the citizen and his wife. Um, and in its own way, it has a coherence, because as I say, the real plot of this play is about theater's adaptability. Now, if you take a look at just the plot of The London Merchant, it is very thin. Okay, so it's a, it's a boy, loves girl, father is obstacle play. Those of you who studied Midsummer Night's Dream know all about this. In Shakespeare's earlier plays, there's uh, his comedies, there's always that love interest, and there's always an external obstacle. As he got more sophisticated and started doing plays like Much Ado About Nothing, uh, the obstacles became more internal. What is it about me that gets in the way of, of loving someone? This play, The London Merchant, has a little bit of that insanity, but it's, but it's barely touched on. So let's take a look at, at The London Merchant and see what we've got. We have um, Jasper, the hero apprentice, who displeases his master venture well by falling in love with daughter Lucy. And then we have the idiot, typically, that um, venture well wants Lucy to marry a well-heeled uh, man named Humphrey. Okay, uh, And we find out that his nickname is Numps, so uh, if you go to Bartholomew Fair, you begin to realize that if you're uh, unlucky enough to be named Humphrey, you're going to be nicknamed Numps. That seems to be the, the word that goes with Humphrey. Um, Humphrey initially simply gets the funniest lines because they make so little sense. Uh, they're written in very bad verse intentionally. The verse is very regular. Uh, it's in rhyming couplets most of the time, so it sounds like a kind of doggerel, and it sounds like it's just said so that you can get an e easy, cheap rhyme at the end, whether it makes any sense or not. Uh, they're full of non sequiturs, things that don't follow. 
uh, on the basis of what has come before, um, inane comments. I mean, actually, Nump's comes off as a as a real real knucklehead. Certainly, nobody we would want to see uh, Lucy married to. Uh, it is just incredibly easy uh, to thwart the marriage of Humphrey and Lucy. Uh, the plot gag here is that uh, Lucy wants to be stolen away uh, from her uh, house uh, in an elopement. She wants Humphrey to steal her off because she thinks it's more romantic. That's what she tells him. And we'll go to Waltham Forest, she tells him. And so Humphrey goes to Venture Well, he says, your daughter, you know, she's a little bit cracked. She wants me to steal her away, but, you know, I'm willing to do that. And, and Venture Well says, well, if it's going to make it more fun for her, go ahead. So so off they go. And who, of course, is waiting out there but but Jasper, who pounds pounds Humphrey, right, and, and could get away at that point with Luce. No problem whatsoever. Okay. Uh, now here we get to the, the absurd internal obstacle. For reasons uh, undisclosed and unbelievable, Jasper decides he wants to try Lucy's faithfulness to him, and, and he's threatening to kill her out there in the woods, and it's all to see whether she'll love him even if he's, he's threatening to kill her, and of course she does, you know, it's, that's pretty ridiculous, but, you know, that's the London merchant. And just as he's getting there, he's interrupted. He's interrupted by uh, a venture well who reclaims Lucy with a whole bunch of other men, and Jasper has to flee, leaving Lucy with the thought that, oh, my beloved Jasper was actually going to murder me out in the forest. So this gives Jasper a problem with, which Jasper rather easily solves. Um, toward the end of the play, he's going to be um, sneaked into the house, uh, I believe, in a casket, pretending to be dead, and... Um, and he's going to see Lucy, and she's going to forgive him very rapidly. And eventually, Venturewell will come around, and they'll they'll be they'll be just fine. Now there are is one other character uh, in the London Merchant who uh, is more interesting. I think the one really interesting character, in it, Mary thought. Okay, this is Jasper's father. Uh, the thing about Mary Thought is that he is relentlessly merry, no matter what happens. Uh, he's relentlessly merry no matter what happens to other people. Uh, he, he seems to be, in some ways, a kind of living, breathing uh, model of what it would be like if you took the Beatitudes seriously. That's his positive point, because he refuses to be worried about anything. And uh, his negative point is that um, he also seems incapable of empathizing with anybody else. And so on the, on the one hand, he seems to be in some ways the ultimate Christian, and on other, in other ways just bizarrely off-kilter uh, in that way. I think Mary Thought is an interesting guy to watch. And we can classify him under the cultural rubric of Lord of Misrule, a Lord of Misrule. The uh, examples in Shakespeare, Toby Belch in Twelfth Night, Falstaff in Henry IV, Part One and Two. The Lord of Misrule was the Lord of Carnival. Uh, and this could occur in various different ways, but the best way to think about it is he's the Carnival King in a place like Rio. And uh, he's basically given license uh, during that day to lead all the revelry, all the drinking, all the partying, and also to invert the social order, to, turn the social order upside down. So in a monastery, you might get the, the youngest, littlest monk uh, on, on this particular day, the day of carnival, and make him the head abbot, and make the abbot a janitor. Just for a day, everything gets to be upended. What we're going to see is that the happy ending of the play comes about largely because Mary Thought is indomitable. Uh, Mary thought cannot be taken down. You could you could threaten this guy with uh, probably skinning him alive tomorrow, and he'd probably still be Mary. And uh, that turns out to be a very strong position to have. Now, as a sidelight, um, there's uh, his wife and his other son, uh, whose 
name is escaping me. I believe it's Michael. Let's see. Yes, it is Michael. And you can imagine that it's a bit difficult to be married to somebody like Mary Thought because he's not very interested in working and, and he expects his dinner to be on the table every night. And he's always had good clothes and and he says, uh, you know, I'm, and basically what he's doing is he's just spending it all, spending it all. So his wife has managed to put away quite a bit of money in jewelry and coin, a thousand pounds worth apparently. And she decides to take the money and run. Okay, so she's going to go off with her uh, son, Michael, and make sure that, that he his inheritance is intact, is not spent. Okay, Jasper's inheritance pretty much has been spent, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit in the next video. Um, everybody is going to have to come back to Mary Thought. Everybody's... Mary Thought in the London Merchant is this interesting center of gravity. Okay. Um, the Night of the Burning Pestle, of course, is a different thing altogether. And it, it really is mysterious because you almost have to believe, and it's certainly possible, that Francis Beaumont knew Spanish and could read Spanish fluently and saw this book, Don Quixote, and really fell in love with it. Don Quixote is a kind of send-up of, of romances and uh, because the Don's adventures always turn out badly for him when you charge a windmill with a lance you don't come out on the top end and uh, things are always happening to him uh, in that way he goes to an inn and we're going to see Rafe do the same thing and he decides the, the inn is a castle and that uh, that he's He's receiving hospitality there, a little bit like Sir Gawain does from Burlack and uh, Sir Gawain in the Green Knight. Uh, and basically all it is is an inn. And the innkeeper, unfortunately, is going to want to be paid and Don Quixote doesn't have any money. So it, it's a send-up of romances and what they can do to you. The interesting thing about Don Quixote is it has a lot of stories embedded in it that really are romances. I think that um, Cervantes loved romances and, and also loves sending romances up. It does both. And um, the grosser errant storyline of The Night of the Burning Pestle does the same thing. Now that storyline lasts for about four acts. And by the time we get to Act 5, it changes. Uh, you've almost run out of story. And it turns into a kind of variety show. And we get a list uh, that's very helpful in the introduction of some of the things that Rafe does. Um, he woos Princess Pomponia of Moldavia. Uh, he becomes the Lord of the May, which again is just a, just a London festival that the citizen and his wife really love and they want to see that put on stage. Uh, he takes place in a muster at Mile End, would be, which would be, well, one place where soldiers really did go out to practice uh, maneuvers. It would be a place you could engage in archery. But I think what, what's happening in that case is very much like the Civil War reenact, reenactments at, at Kearney Park. So, so they get that. And then finally, at the very end, we get a long, uh, heartbreaking speech from Rafe's ghost as he's... Uh, as he's uh, killed uh, in some kind of heroic battle and, and comes back to talk about it. So one play, perhaps not a very good one, although Mary thought is interesting. Uh, the other play, um, also perhaps not the best play, although it has some extremely funny moments. Uh, and we learn a lot about London and what Londoners like. The best play is what the citizen and his wife have to say about what's going on on stage. Um, and it's this blend that I think makes The Night of the Burning Pestle uh, a wonderful piece of work.